Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you and uh, welcome to Digital Wellness, the Future of Student Wellbeing. My name is Lisa Pender and I am a digital wellness educator and faculty member of sociology in uh, Mohawk College. Um, so I'm super excited uh, that you are here today. I am very passionate about digital wellness and uh, I want to thank eCampus Ontario and the test committee for uh, the warm welcome for everybody this morning, as well as the thoughtful land acknowledgement uh, that we heard. And I am very thrilled to be here. <laughs> and I just want to give you a little bit of background about this presentation. So this is a bit of a snapshot, if you will, of a larger uh, workshop and presentation that I've been delivering over the past year to faculty, students, um, and student leadership, leadership programs across uh, a few different colleges. And what we are going to do is really kind of take time to reflect on what student wellness means, of course, now and into the future. And as you know, the pandemic significantly accelerated our reliance and dependency on technology and resulted in a substantial increase in the amount of daily screen time that we use in order to work, in order to study and stay connected with others. Unfortunately, though, uh, this has come at a cost and the research is beginning to paint a very clear picture that this has had a very real toll on our students health and well being. And for this reason, I truly feel that digital wellness needs to become an integral part of our digital literacy education in higher ed, uh, preferably part of one's first year experience. So in today's talk, I do have a hefty agenda, <laughs> but in today's talk, we're first going to explore the concept of digital wellness. Um, and then we are going to look at some strategies that can help us and our students maintain a healthy relationship with technology in our increasingly device dependent world. So first of all, I just want to talk a little bit um, about digital responsibility. And when we go online, we automatically become a global citizen, right? And then it becomes everybody's digital responsibility to understand how their online actions shape other people's lived experiences. And we need to act in a way that is digitally responsible, which is using technology in a way that does not harm ourselves or others. And part of that is cultivating an awareness of the impact that technology has on our own health and, and of those whom we interact with, the environment and society at large. And digital wellness helps us to gain a greater awareness as to how we interact with technology and what those impacts are. So we are going to get into thinking, um, what is digital wellness? And I recognize that not everybody is actually familiar with this term or this concept. And so I thought maybe using the chat, we would type in what digital wellness means to you. So when you saw the title of this presentation, what kind of came to mind? And there's uh, no, no wrong answers. <laughs> but if you would like to put some of them in the chat, I would love, I would love to read them and take a look at what is coming to mind. Awesome, yes, taking a break from screens when needed, awareness of content being consumed, absolutely. I love these. Balance, having a good amount of your life and time that is not shared and preoccupied with tech. Absolutely. Absolutely. Knowing when to walk away from the screen and device. Absolutely. You guys are right on track. <laughs> you are right on track with this for sure. So I'm going to share with you uh, the definition of uh, digital wellness, which Digital wellness is really, and I'm still watching those come in from the feed. <laughs> um, the concept of digital wellness is a, is a very kind of burgeoning field, and it stems from a field known as positive media psychology, which is a bit of an intersection between positive psychology, sociology, and media studies. And digital wellness is defined as the optimal state of health and well-being that one can achieve while using technology. 
So we all know what wellness is. So if wellness is the act of practicing healthy habits on a daily basis to attain better physical and mental health, then digital wellness is the act of practicing healthy digital habits. Uh, so digital wellness empowers us really to take advantage of all the wonderful benefits of technology while avoiding any associated harms. Well, I got too fast there. And so how do we do that? <laughs> it sounds simple, but how do we do that? Well, digital wellness can really be achieved by taking a mindful and intentional approach to technology. We need to use tech in a way that supports our thriving and our optimal well-being. And when we are mindful, we are aware of what our thoughts and our feelings are in the moment. So we have to have a really high degree of self-awareness in order to accomplish this. And so I say to people, you know, in order to be digitally well, we have to use technology in a way that is thoughtful, intentional, and purposeful. So this is where this mindfulness piece comes in. Mindfulness is about being aware of ourselves in the moment. We want to be intentional with our use of technology versus being passive. We need to be active versus reactive. We need to be deliberate and we need to do things with purpose. And so we have to continually reflect on our online experiences and give careful consideration to what we're doing and how we're feeling in any given moment. I want to share with you uh, the Digital Flourishing Wheel, which is a framework for improving our digital wellness um, habits. And in order to thrive alongside technology, we have to enhance our skills in these key areas, okay, that our digital behaviors relate to. And that includes our mental and our physical health, our relationships, productivity, communication, environment, and digital citizenship. And we need to teach students the skills and knowledge and the competencies that they need to navigate and thrive in the online world today. It's easy to think that these students have these skills because they're born into a generation of technology, but they will be the first ones to tell you uh, that they also really do need help uh, when it comes to these areas. Um, and so what I'm going to do, for instance, I'm going to give you um, an example of just one piece of this digital flourishing wheel, which is digital citizenship. And digital citizenship education, it's not new, right? This includes all of the skills and the knowledge that we need to effectively navigate the online world today. Um, in a way that promotes optimal well being for ourselves and others. So, this includes things like appropriate online etiquette, cultivating you know, an awareness and understanding of privacy, copyright laws, online safety, learning how the attention economy works and how big data works. Um, that's all part of it. But then there's another large part of it that includes recognizing and reporting, uh, certainly not engaging in. Uh, things like cyber racism, um, hate speech, cyber bullying. Uh, it means learning how to be an activist online without ruining your professional reputation, um, developing anti-racist digital practices and treating others with dignity and respect in a virtual space. So you can see that digital citizenship education is an, it's a very essential component to digital wellness. Students are not going to be digitally well if they don't feel safe in an online environment or if they're being excluded or oppressed or harassed or targets of hate speech, right? So we can see here that digital wellness practices can actively promote equity, diversity, and inclusion um, in higher ed. So that was just one example, and I'm going to get to a few more in a bit. Uh, but one thing, um, if you haven't guessed by now, <laughs> I'm not about being anti-tech. Um, I love technology as much as the rest of you do. Um, it's not that it's bad, it's that it's too good. It's too good. And we are digitally distracted, and we are checking or unlocking our phones an average of 150 times per day. Um, so if the current trends continue, our students today will lose an average of seven years of their life to their cell phone, which is a staggering, staggering statistic. <laughs> but uh, time spent on devices really is only one part of the problem. Now, I know that there is a uh, 
a click or a, I'm sorry, a target that you have on your screen that will launch a poll. And it is going to ask you um, if you've been affected by technology in any of the following ways over the past year. Um, so you will see if you click on that, um, I'm just going to activate it here from my end. Uh, which of the following tech related issues have you experienced, whether it's physical aches and pains, inactivity, um, eye strain, eye dryness, poor vision, feelings of loneliness or disengagement, trouble falling asleep, decreased productivity, trouble concentrating or focusing, increased distractions, increased stress, anxiety or depression. I hope that you can see that on your end. <laughs> I hope that you're able to interact with that poll. And thank you for doing that. I'm going to post this at the end. I'm going to post the results for you. Uh, but let me share with you what the impacts of technology are. And it is very much all of what you're experiencing. Um, so we are talking about things like sleep. We are talking about talking about really here the impact. And this is just for instance, right? We and and one thing is for sure, we need to remember that this relationship is correlational, not causal. So for instance, if we're talking about sleep disturbances, this can be caused by a whole host of reasons, from medications to the hours that we work. Um, however, we do know that there is a correlation between device use before bedtime and sleep disturbances. So the, some of the major impacts that we know uh, that we are having, as well as our students are sleep, having difficulty falling or staying asleep, inactivity and in our physiological health. Uh, a recent uh, article published in the Journal of Higher Ed tells us that 75% of students report feeling the physical effects of screen time. So things like tech neck and sore back and shoulders or sore wrists, um, but also includes things like headaches and eye strain as well and increased sedentary behaviors. When it comes to mental wellness, feeling drained or unmotivated, feeling increased stress or anxiousness or even depression, um, that same study tells us that, you know, 50% of students were worried about their mental well-being coming into this fall semester. Um, number four, social relationships and loneliness. You know, it broke my heart to just listen to one of the student panelists there uh, talking about a collapse of community. Um, and I will talk to that uh, in a little bit, but you know, social relationships and loneliness, that lack of connectedness um, that's feeling from increased um, screen time as well as feeling more isolated or disconnected. Uh, distraction and productivity, you know, finding it harder to stay organized and stay on track and getting things done. Um, this tells us that it is imperative, right, that we provide students with the self-care skills to help them survive in a digital world instead of being overwhelmed by it. So one of the things, uh, one of the strategies that I like to share with students is this concept of a digital diet. And this comes from Dr. Shimmy Kang from the University of British Columbia, who is a, a Harvard trained psychiatrist. And she talks about how we consume technology the same way we consume food. And we can consume food that is healthy and nourishing and aids in our overall health and well being, or we can consume junk food, right? High in sugar, high in sodium, high in fat that leaves us feeling generally unwell and uh, just depleted. <laughs> and most importantly, if we don't consume that kind of food in moderation, right, it can lead to very serious health issues down the road. Well, technology works exactly the same way. You know, we can consume junk tech or we can consume healthy tech. And junk tech has negative emotional and physical effects that can range from something as simple as, you know, unintentional scrolling behaviors to things that start affecting our psyche, like doom scrolling or social media comparisons um, to the very far end of the spectrum that can border on uh, what I would call toxic tech, which would be things like pornography and cyberbullying or sexting and things like that. 
we can often identify junk tech in our life because it, it leaves us feeling very anxious and nervous and kind of uh, triggers that stress response in the body. But health tech, on the other hand, right, can leave us feeling inspired and healthy physically, emotionally, socially, right? It might be used to enhance our skills such as, or our creativity, you know, such as taking a cooking class online or, you know, positive connections and FaceTimes with grandma. Uh, maybe it's used for self-care, that kind of thing. But any tech that is used in a way that fuels us rather than depletes us. And so what I'm going to do now is share with you some of the digital wellness strategies that I offer students, which is really a heart of the workshops that I conduct. Now, keep in mind, this is condensed in a big way for the sake of time, but each piece is really aimed at buffering the six impacts of technology that we talked about a little bit earlier. And the very first one, seems obvious, <laughs> which is get enough sleep. But we know that 41% of students right now are getting less sleep than they did prior to the pandemic, 44% uh, to be exact. Um, the problem is that the majority of us, and when I say majority, 95% of us check our phones within one hour before going to bed. And then the blue light from the screens, it stimulates our brain and it interferes with our sleep cycle or our circadian rhythm, making it very hard to fall asleep or stay asleep. Um, not to mention that a surprising number of Gen Zs love to sleep with their phone underneath their pillow. <laughs> and, you know, so what can we do here? Well, there's a couple things we can do. Uh, certainly, we need to educate on the importance of limiting screen time at least an hour before bed. So the brain can shut down. Um, but if that can't be done, then at least turning the, the phone to grayscale um, is a really uh, simple but very, very effective trick. And you can access this in your phone's settings, but it eliminates those blue light triggers. And also because it's turning things to grayscale, when things aren't in color, they're a whole lot less appealing. And so it kind of, it's that psychological thing that it does to the brain where it says, you know what, my phone is no longer as fun at night, so maybe I'm gonna put it down. The next one uh, that is very important to buffer the inactivity and physical activity of screen time um, is to take regular mind and body breaks, okay? Um, so I advise regular check-ins with ourselves to see how we're feeling with regards to, you know, our level of tech tolerance in that moment. And I advise the Pomodoro technique of time intervals where we set that timer to take a break after 20 minutes of deep work. Uh, because it does a few things. Um, it helps combat eye strain and obviously gets the body moving, um, you know, stimulates the brain through increased oxygen and releases those feel good endorphins that we all love. Um, or even if we're just taking some time to meditate or recenter or exercise or walk, whatever it is. Um, again, that same study I was referring to uh, is also saying that, you know, 44% of students admit to getting less physical activity than they did before the pandemic. And I know that some people say, well, it's all about time. It's all about time. I don't have time to work out. Uh, but I say, you know what, when we were in the throes of that pandemic, um, and, and many of us are choosing to work uh, from home or remotely or choosing online, classes, I say, well, you know what, the workout is the new commute, <laughs> right? People say they don't have time, but I recommend using that time to recreate the commute. Uh, I think it's a great way to differentiate the start and the end of a work day, and it helps create those work-life boundaries. Um, so by saying, hey, you know what, when my, my watch goes off at five o'clock, I'm going to go for a walk, and when I come back, now that is my time. That is the end of my day. That signals that to me. Um, so I think those things can be really, really important. Now, the next one here, um, I, I think is super important to talk about because this is what uh, the student was saying in that previous, um, the previous workshop here about the collapse of the community. And, um, you know, I can't, I can't stress this one enough. It is simple, but to buffer the loneliness and isolation that students are feeling, and we saw it, and it was very raw with her today. Um, we have to encourage face-to-face -face in real life relationships. 
And the data tells us that we do not perceive online interactions to be as satisfying or of the same quality of interaction as those experienced in person. And one of the most discouraging findings that I have come across is that the Gen Z or the I generation, the ones born 95 and beyond, have spent less time with their friends in person than any other generation. And this undoubtedly is contributing to the unprecedented levels that we are seeing of anxiety and depression and loneliness. Um, but they're not the only ones. You know, uh, Narina Hertz uh, published a book this year called um, called The Lonely Century, you know, and she talked about the causes of today's loneliness crisis, one part of it being smartphones and social media. But she also outlined that all of us are spending less time in the physical presence of others than we ever have. Um, you know, whether it's going to church or being part of a larger community group or parent teacher association, all of these types of things are finding declining attendance. And when we think about it, you know, humans are inherently social, right? And in evolutionary terms, uh, a lonely human would not have survived. So I truly feel that being connected is that not, is a part of this natural desired state of the human condition. And when we are face to face with others, we have to be 100% physically and emotionally present and not fubbing. And if you're not familiar with fubbing, fubbing is phone snubbing. And um, it is a term that refers to the fact that we will um, ignore people who are in our presence um, and, and, and in pursuit of our digital devices that we have in hand. And we know that that too interferes with the perceived quality of the relationship um, and the social interaction that we have in purpose um, in, in that moment. And we don't want to deprive ourselves of the social interactions that we have because they make us feel a part of wider society. So they are really, really important. The next thing I uh, like to talk about with students is obviously managing digital distractions, right? And the best way we can do that is by creating digital boundaries. Um, so, you know, the, at the very least we can remove or we can block notifications uh, when we really do want to stay present with what we're doing, whether we're in front of others or whether we're in states of uh, deep work which is what I call, you know, the, you know, deep uh, focused work uh, with no distractions. And so, I mean, at the very least we can mute or block notifications, but at very best we can remove our phone from our study or workspace altogether, which is known as situation modification. And what that is, is it's um, sometimes called situational self-control uh, because it involves intentionally changing your physical surroundings to make it easier to resist temptation. Uh, so for example, if you're driving, uh, you're going to keep your phone in your back seat because that way you can't reach it. Um, and then it removes that temptation to grab it and take a look at it when you know uh, you need to be focusing on what it is in the moment. And that takes us to the myth of multitasking. Um, and we, part of, I guess, managing um, the multiple distractions that we have in a day uh, is, you know, we have to kind of drop this ridiculous notion that just because we're busy, uh, we're being productive and it doesn't work like that. Being busy stresses me out. <laughs> I know it stresses out others. It increases our error rate and it interferes with our ability to process information. And we know, and studies are telling us this, that doing one thing at a time is infinitely more productive than multitasking. And the more accurate term is actually continuous partial attention or task switching, right? When we move from one task to another, it takes people an average of 11 to 20 minutes to return to full deep work mode. Um, so task switching is, is um, increasing our error rates, and it is also causing something that we call attention residue. Uh, and that is our inability to fully transition from task A to task B. And in turn, it fragments our focus and our attention. And essentially, when we move from task A to task B, our attention is still left on task A. Um, so not a fan of multitasking. 
Lastly, um, I would say, you know, it's important to limit uh, the time spent on social media. Um, again, this is part of creating digital boundaries. Um, but, you know, it's not productive. <laughs> we know it can be a bit of a time sucker and takes us away from doing things that are more important to us. But most importantly, when it comes to our students, uh, it has to do with the negative effect that it's starting to show to have on mental health if not used properly. And the research tells us that people who are spending more than two hours a day on social media have significantly lower self-esteem uh, than those who don't. And um, a recent study actually in the Journal of Preventative Medicine found that young adults who have the highest perceived um, social media use have the highest rates of social isolation. So we certainly know that moderation is the key there. Uh, but the other difference is the difference between active and passive use, you know, and what we need to start asking ourselves is what is our purpose for being on social media? Am I going through a, a feed to see what other people are doing, um, you know, or do I have like an active, um, am I actively engaging with purpose, right? Because studies show that if we're active users by way of posting and commenting on other people's social media, uh, that has better outcomes for us than if we are just passively using it, scrolling, but not really engaging in it, right? Um, but this is a talk for another day. <laughs> Lastly, uh, we can certainly take inventory on the time we're spending on devices. This can be particularly helpful uh, because we quite often underestimate how much we actually use uh, social media really or any of our apps that we're on. So um, it can be found under smart, uh, smart settings um, on your phone, digital well-being and digital wellness settings. And when we know what our attention is going to, we can start to limit and regulate usage. So this takes me to the very end of my presentation, and um, I want to share this link with you uh, to the Digital Flourishing Survey. And this is a tool that can help improve your digital consumption and habits. You can share it with your students or you can do it yourself. Um, and the results will offer some tips to improve any weak areas that, uh, that could be there for you. And I just want to stress that today is just an introduction, if you can tell by how fast I'm talking. <laughs> um, but there's just so much to explore with this topic. This entire wheel is just so relevant, important to all of us um, now and in the future. But uh, as I said at the beginning, I'm just so passionate about giving students these coping skills um, because we want them to flourish alongside technology. Um, not only in our post-secondary environment, but in their future careers and in their personal lives. So um, I hope that there was something here uh, that you could take home today. So I'm going to open up the floor to any questions uh, that you may have. And let me get this in the chat, actually. <laughs> Before you go anywhere, I'm going to give you this link. And uh, so this is a link to the Digital Flourishing Survey. And then I also have for you, and please reach out. Um, I'd love to extend this conversation. I love to uh, talk all things digital wellness, <laughs> um, but I am going to give you um, a copy of the a copy of the presentation notes that you can have to take home with you today. I have a Google Doc for you. Sorry, I'm just trying to multitask. Here. <laughs> and this is why I don't like to do it. I'm getting it in there for everyone. There you go. Okay, so you can um, grab the notes from today's presentation. Um, it was wonderful to see everybody here today. Thank you so much for uh, joining me. And um, and please reach out if you have any further questions or to extend this conversation. If you would like to just jump on and ask a question, um, feel free to take the floor. <laughs> I know some people are going to be running to the next session.
but I'm happy to hang back if anybody has any questions. Uh, hi, Lisa, can you hear me? Hi, yes. Hi, hi Mario. Um, I'm, I'm co-founder of a platform actually focused on information wellness. So it's like a subset oh, it of is. digital wellness. Um, so I'm looking forward to connecting after. This is amazing. Oh, good. Um, but I was curious what, you, what your thoughts are on that because digital wellness obviously is you know, quite all encompassing. And I think somebody in the chat also mentioned, you know, we can have screen time, but that doesn't necessarily tell us like not all screen time is bad, right? No. And so how do you feel about um, digital diet versus specifically information diet? Almost like you have the screen time and then you have what happens in the screen time. And so how do we differentiate these things? And, and do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, so it was funny because, um, you know, I would say prior to the pandemic, the big question was how much screen time is too much, right? Parents are asking that, parent, right? Um, and, <laughs> and the thing is, is that the pandemic just threw all of that out, right? And, and, and there was, there's no option. We couldn't limit our kids' screen time. Um, you know, my son probably went on average from one hour a day to seven hours a day, right? Uh, with remote learning. And so, so, you know, and the studies aren't here yet. <laughs> we're getting there, right? Um, there's there's data coming out on this, but the you know we're learning that it's not it's not the quantity of the interaction, it's the quality of the interaction, right? So we definitely know that. We certainly know that you know a 14 year old boy can spend um, two hours of really quality time facetiming friends and feeling connected, and you know. Um, is going to be much more, infinitely more productive than, of course, spending even just five minutes on pornography. Um, so, so it's good that we're moving away from that because it's not really about the amount of time. Um, I shouldn't say that. It is for it is for young youth, right? For babies under one, they say no screen time at all. Um, you know, for kids two to five, the you know the max is one hour a day. Um, but really, it's it's about the quality over quantity, and so I'm glad that we're kind of moving from that now. Um, so I'm not quite sure if I answered your question. <laughs> but no, that, that was that's great, and quality over quantity is like such a big thing that we don't talk about enough. So no, that was that was great. Thank you. It is, yeah, yeah. And that's not to say, right, that because uh, our students are getting more and more of, of, you know, screen time, that that is infinitely bad. That's not it, right? But I think it think it's all about being aware, being self-aware. And this is really where the mindfulness piece really does come in. You can see this kind of um, intersecting. Um, but being able to kind of step, step back and go, you know what? <laughs> You know, I'm not being productive today. You know, another thing that I really talk about is is setting intentions in the morning, right? Um, and making sure we're hitting those things on our to-do list because it's so easy to get distracted. It is so easy to get off off target, you know? So even just being aware of that and going, oh, wow, you know, it's 11 o'clock and I went to go and answer that email. And then, you know, you get so distracted by whatever it is, a feed or um, or other emails and things like that, right? It's just it's just about that self-awareness piece, I think is a really, really big one. Uh, and I think that students are getting on the wellness train, right? Mindfulness is something that is becoming much more mainstream, you know, because the science is getting behind it in terms of the benefits of it, the same way that exercise is, you know? So I think we're going to see more and more of this in the future and people are just gonna be a little bit more self-aware. Um, and then they're able to take a break if they need it. They're able to recognize when, you know what, I've, I've been on my phone and you know what, I don't feel good after what, looking at this material. Um, I have to put it away. You know, I used to be obsessed with the statistics of COVID and the number of cases. And I used to look at it every single night. And then the next thing you know, I'm, I'm watching the national and I'm hearing about it. And, and then I realized like, my gosh, I'm not sleeping at night. <laughs> because I was consuming too much. And that's really what doom scrolling is, right? It's, it's just that it's like watching a train wreck and I just got obsessed with it. Um, and then I have to, it's just that awareness of being able to go, okay, wait a minute, this, this, isn't, this isn't sitting well with me, right? Now I'm not sleeping and now I have anxiety about this. So it's all just about awareness and um, yeah, quite simply, that's what it is. Were there any other questions <laughs> or comments? Anybody want to share?
I don't want to hog the floor, so I'm going to wait one more <laughs> minute to see if anybody yeah, sure, else. Sure, <laughs> sure. Absolutely. No, nobody else. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, I depending on how much time is a, a first set of question and then, and then a comment, but another question was if you found any effect in this, because one thing that seems to be a challenge is making these subjects feel more literal. So, for example, the parallel between, um, you know, nutrition labels and nutrition science and all these terms that help us in the difference of a burger and a salad, mm -hmm. having those things to make them more relatable when we see a piece of content or we see certain times, like ways we spend our time, but even just like the value of our time, there's always this graphic, I think it was a, on the Wait But Why blog, but they showed our life in terms of jelly beans or something like that. And just how, how like cutting off proportions after you take into account school and you're sleeping and the time you waste and all this kind of stuff. And you, then you see there's nothing left. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder how much more impactful it would be with young people if, if we had exercises that help make these kind of uh, things that seem quite vague, much more literal. And so mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you've seen any good ex exercise around this or if you have any thoughts on that. No, I haven't seen anything um, to that effect, no. Um really great work in this field is, is media smarts. Um, and yeah, they're just a fabulous organization offering tons and tons of resources to schools, free presentations for teachers. Um, but they, they mostly just focus on the K to 12. Um, so, uh, so there's not a lot, there's not a lot kind of in the, in the higher ed spectrum, but I truly believe too, that, you know, the younger, the younger uh, people become kind of aware of all this, um, obviously the better. Um, when they come to college, I think sometimes they, like I said, we I think we assume at the higher ed level, right, that people are coming in with these types of skills. Um, and we're, we know that they're not, we know that they're not. And students, as I said, my presentation are, are the first ones to tell you like, no, we need help with this. You know, I remember the first presentation I did on digital wellness. Um, you know, I had 100 students sign up in a week, and that was during reading week. And, you know, the student life, I remember that was helping me with it at the time, they were floored, um, you know, that students were willing to, you know, come on during their reading week when they typically kind of just tune out, um, you know, and want to get a good break on things. Um, and this is really, this is kind of what sparked it for me. And this is during the pandemic. So this was, this was, um, you know, last year during reading week. And they're just on board and they, they just want all of the tools, um, you know, possible to, to kind of th to thrive in this world, right? They feel it. Um, but no, no, I haven't, I haven't seen anything in particular when it came to that. And I'm not even sure about the whole jelly bean referral there. I haven't, uh, I haven't seen that one. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll dig it up and send it to you. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Okay, everybody. Well, I've been told to uh, wrap up the session. So thank you so much. Uh, it was great seeing you here and uh, feel free to reach out. Feel free to reach out to extend the conversation.